Thanks, Thomas and uh, worship team for leading us this morning, worship teams. We're in this series uh, called Simply Believe, and I invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3. How many of you are familiar with the story of Nicodemus? Uh, how many of you would say you've heard at least five sermons on the story of Nicodemus? Okay, uh, 10. Do I hear 20? Okay, this is a very, very familiar story, uh, but I hope today that we'll be able to see some, some new ideas here. Now, before I go any further, I want to let you know that there is a, uh, a, a disease that has been discovered that can be caught around churches. Uh, there's no mask that can keep you from catching this disease. Uh, hand sanitizer won't help with this virus or its sub-variants. This disease is worse around uh, Bible colleges and seminaries. I guarantee it. I've been there and seen it. I call it halitosis religiosis. It's not just the bad breath that you get from drinking the church coffee. No, it's much more insidious than that. Its symptoms are pride, knowing all the answers, having an amazing ability to give grace to yourself but judge others harshly. It gets a lot of the theology right, but it gets the heart wrong. It gets the relationship wrong. In its advanced stages, it can cause its victims to walk, talk, attend church, read the Bible, in fact, look good, smell good, act good, but in fact, be dead inside. My sermon this morning is called Walking Dead or Born Again. Some of you may be familiar with the TV show called The Walking Dead. It's been going on now for 10 years. I don't know how those people are still alive. It's a small group of people that are, that are trying to keep from being infected by zombies and uh, are fighting to stay alive or born again. John chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. If you remember, chapter 2 ends with this statement that Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to those who, quote unquote, believed in him because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about humanity, for he himself knew what was in humanity. That word there is anthropos, it has to do with every human being. And last week we talked about that desire that we have, that ability we have inside to twist even good things for our own selfish purposes. And so Jesus said, I'm not going to entrust myself to you. They saw his miracles, they saw his signs, and they got excited and they said, yeah, that's the Messiah. And they wanted to make him king by force. And so he said, now's not the time for that. So chapter 3 verse 1 starts with, there was an anthropos, there was a human being. No doubt Nicodemus had been in the temple. No doubt Jesus, uh, Nicodemus had been in Jerusalem and had seen and heard what's going on. In fact, he might have even gotten a chuckle out of what happened in the temple that day, being a Pharisee. He's established. He's comfortable, he's secure, he's intelligent, he's well-educated, he's respected, he's successful. In fact, by every metric you can possibly imagine, he is at the top of the heap, the top of his game. He's got the world by, his ta by the tail, and yet he comes to Jesus. The scripture tells us that Jesus refers to him not as a teacher, which a Pharisee would have been, but as the teacher. You're the teacher of Israel. So he was prominent, published, had his own podcast. He was one of those guys that everybody wanted to hear what he had to say. Pharisee is from the Greek word taken from the Aramaic word, meaning he was a separated one. And Pharisees specialized in knowing the 
smallest and most minute detail of the law and then obeying it to the nth degree. They led synagogue worship. They avoided association with ignorant people. They were scrupulous with regard to paying tithes and taking of vows. The Roman historian Josephus wrote, the Pharisees lived thriftily, giving in to no luxury. Jesus and Paul both spoke highly of the zeal of the Pharisees. But unlike the Sadducees, the Pharisees were middle class. They were regular kind of people. They were popular with the people. Pharisees didn't do much in the temple because that was the domain of the Sadducees. The Sadducees were concerned mainly with the, with the temple and that kind of thing, and they were separated from the two. These were low-level officials. These were teachers, judges, bureaucrats. And it says that he was a ruler of the Jews. So that means he was also part of the Sanhedrin. That's that 70-member ruling body of the Jewish people. Most of those were Sadducees, but of the five Pharisees that sat on that state, three of them are listed in Scripture. There was Nicodemus, there's Joseph of Arimathea, and there's Gamaliel. Now we go into this study, we see Nicodemus literally and physically and spiritually in the dark at night coming to him, and we're left with questions. What is Nicodemus' heart? Where is he with the Lord? Where is he spiritually? All we know at the beginning of this is we think he's curious. He's curious. He's interested. He's risking a lot. He wants to know and he's willing to come at night for fear of the Jews. He's a blend of curiosity and timidity. Look then at verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. My first point this morning, if you're following along the outline, is born, being born again is a new life, not just an old religion. Why did Nicodemus come at night? One uh, commentator called this, just so we can remember, it's Nick at night. Why did he come at night? Well, maybe he was busy all during the day. Or maybe he was afraid. John 1242 says that many of the authorities, many of the ruling Jews believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so they would not be put out of the synagogue. Listen, a guy of Nicodemus's stature, of his standing, of his wealth, of his power, of his influence, had so much to lose by, see, by being seen with this upstart Jesus. To be sure, Nicodemus and Jesus talked for more than the two minutes of dialogue that the scripture has recorded for us here. I know because I read it out loud. It takes two minutes. You can rest assured they talk more. But John is capturing the essence of what was happening here. And notice that he calls him rabbi or teacher. It's an honored position. But he's not the Messiah, he's not Lord, he's not Son of God, he's not Son of David, he's not Son of Man. And he acknowledges, well, you came from God. Maybe you're a prophet. Maybe you've got some insight that you'd like to share with us. And he says, you've done these signs. I mean, he's kind of heaping on some, some praise. He's kind of buttering them up, isn't he? Nicodemus gives him a lot of respect, even though he doesn't have the credentials that a teacher under Hillel or under Gamaliel or one of the other great teachers of the law would have. But notice that Jesus totally ignores that. Jesus isn't interested whether Nicodemus was impressed with those signs. Spectacular things will always get attention. It's easy to get and our own selfish ways can say, more bread. Give me more. Where can I get some more of that? Where can I get some more water? Where can I get, 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 get? Jesus isn't interested in catering to that. 
And so he says in verse 3, truly, truly. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. These words, truly, truly, are very interesting. Or maybe King James, verily, verily. These are words that we're used to saying at the end of a statement or at the end of a prayer. The Greek word is amen. He says, amen, amen. So let's just try that. I'm going to say truly, truly, and you say amen or amen, whatever you prefer. So let's give it a try. Truly, truly, amen, amen. Very good. I knew I could get our congregation to say amen, Thomas. It's just it's taking that long. Good. We're working on it. We're making progress. Truly, truly. So Jesus says you must be born again. That phrase comes up three times here. And this word born is a favorite of John's. He uses it more than all the other gospel writers put together. In John 16, 21, he's, Jesus says, When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy, for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Can I get an amen, ladies? Amen. Our first child was about to be born. We were excited about her coming. We thought she was going to come around the, the end of uh, October. Uh, but she had other plans. She decided to, to wait about a week. And then once she started to make her entrance into the world, she decided to make even that go slow, about 30 hours of labor. And so finally she was in her arms. We were happy. We were, she was healthy. I, needless to say, after that ordeal, I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm just kidding. Val was exhausted, and, uh, and, uh, and we were elated. Little did we know how much our lives would change. Little did we know what an impact that this little bundle of joy would make on our lives. As prepared as we were, we had no idea how we would grow in our love, grow in our depth of, of relationship, because she came into our lives. The brand new experience that we had as first-time parents was amazing. But imagine the experience for her. Warm, secure, comfortable. I think I'll stay here a little longer and a little longer and a little longer. She didn't want to come and then thrust out into this new world with the, with the experiences of light and sound and, and, and breathing in air and being able to grow and interact with the world around her. Jesus uses this word born as a way of understanding this coming into being. This, not just, not just from the perspective of physical birth, but just actually of becoming. It, it embraces both the, the understanding of a mother giving birth, but also of parents creating someone new. This phrase being born, born Again, or some of your translations say born anew. The word really has to do with this idea of something different, not like the old birth, as we'll see in just a moment. Some have even said it's like the word from above, born from above. So what is this new cataclysmic experience where something new becomes alive? Remember, as a Pharisee, Nicodemus would have said, hey, Path to God, I got this. Hey, I'm a PhD expert. I'm the teacher. Let me school you, uh, little rabbi from up north. I'm going to tell you what it's all about. In his day, it would have been this idea of A, being born a Jew. B, now I follow the law. I'm good to go. And the better I can follow the law and the more precise I can be and the more legalistic I can be, the better. Jesus says, nope, you've got to be born. Now, of course, Nicodemus had been born already. He was a breathing, thinking, feeling, acting human being made in the image of God. But evidently, Jesus thinks there's something missing. There's something else that he needs to do become truly alive. 
Merriam-Webster defines dead as deprived of life, lacking power to move, feel, or respond, incapable of being stirred emotionally, intellectually, and I would add spiritually. The scriptural condition that we have before new birth is we are dead. Paul said it this way, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. We were separated from God. We had no ability to respond to him, to be stirred spiritually, to feel or to move in the spiritual realms. That's where the scripture says all of humanity starts. Colossians chapter 2, when you were dead in your sins and this uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ and he forgave all of your sins. That's the process. That's what he's talking about, this coming alive process. Before the new birth happens to us, we are spiritually dead. We are morally selfish and rebellious. We are legally guilty before God's law and under his wrath. We are under condemnation. We're under dishonor. We're powerless. We're D-E-A-D, dead. Humanity is broken beyond repair, and God is not just going to patch us up. He's not just going to download an update. He's not going to make some kind of of of, of a new version of us. No, he's going to start from scratch, and he's going to give us a new birth. Peter said it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born anew. 2 Corinthians 5.17, one of the very first verses I ever memorized as a new Christian, says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. New birth. New experience. A cataclysmic experience of a completely different type. I love one uh, commentator of old said this, to be born again is to enter upon a new existence, to have a new mind, a new heart, new views, new principles, new tastes, new affections, new likings, new dislikings, new fears, new joys, new sorrows, new love for things uh, to things once hated, new hatred for things once loved, new thoughts of God, new thoughts of ourselves, new thoughts of the world, new thoughts of life to come, and new thoughts of salvation. How important is it to be born from above? Well, Jesus says, without it, You can't see the kingdom of God. Verse 5 says, you can't enter the kingdom of God. And this is a phrase that Nicodemus would have been totally in understanding of. That kingdom of God, that Isaiah chapter 9, where he, the, the Savior, will reign forever and ever. His kingdom shall have no end. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. That's what, what is becoming clear. And Jesus says, if you're not born again, you're never, ever going to see that. You, the expert of the law, will never see it. Well, look at Nicodemus' response in verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus knew what birth was. At his age, he'd had children and grandchildren. He was well uh, acquainted with that process. And honestly, every time I've ever read this passage, I thought Nicodemus was being sarcastic. Oh, sure, Jesus, that's going to happen. Right. Not. That, that's impossible, and we all know it. Jesus, that's silly. Why would you even say that? But I'd like you to consider that it might have been a more thoughtful comment of regret and longing. Because just like you and just like me, Nicodemus was a mixture of doubts and uncertainties and hopes and fears, of good habits and bad habits built up over the years. What if he was thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful to start over? Wouldn't it be amazing to have all the regret 
and all the weight and all those, those habits and things that have crept into my life that I just can't seem to shake to be free from all that. Wouldn't it be wonderful not to have to carry the burden of this law around with me all the time? You know, the law for the Pharisees, there were the Ten Commandments, of course, but then Jewish scholars have gone through and found 613 direct commands from the Scriptures, so, so Nicodemus was thinking about them. And then, then around the year 200, the oral traditions of the Pharisees were put together in 63 volumes called the Mishnah, putting thousands upon thousands of laws on something like, thou shalt not work, you shall honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Well, they brought it down to how many steps you could take or how many words you could write. If you've been to modern day Israel, you know on the Sabbath, uh, several of you have been there, elevators don't work on the Sabbath. You know why that is? Because it's considered kindling a fire to press a button. Now, we look at that and maybe we laugh and we say, well, that just seems ridiculous. But this deep desire, this deep burden to please God by my actions, what can I do? How can I make it? How can I be good enough? Is it possible that Nicodemus was longing to be free from that? And here's what Jesus says. And Jesus answered, truly, truly. Truly, truly, amen. amen, amen. I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is Jesus doing? He's expanding on what it means to be born again. He says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. There are a variety of interpretations as to what this means. Maybe you, uh, who've heard 20 sermons on this, have, have an idea on it. One commentary I read said, this phrase, born of the water and the spirit, is genuinely difficult. So, so given that as it is. For some, the idea of water is physical birth, and spirit is spiritual birth. Connect that to verse 6, and you see the water is the flesh, and the Spirit is, again, the Holy Spirit. And that's possible. But water in that culture was not connected with birth. We think of amniotic fluid, and, and, uh, and I believe me, and I've seen plenty of that in, uh, in my experience. Uh, I've attended the birth of all four of our children, uh, and I have, I've, uh, I've, I've been there and seen that. Uh, uh, any of those of you fathers who have been in that room know that mom has doctors, the, the, the babies have doctors, or the baby has doctor, and you get a doctor, just in case you go down, right? Well, that wasn't the case in that, in that culture. There, there wasn't that idea. It's possible that Jesus is just correcting what, what Nicodemus is saying. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like physical birth, right? And Jesus says, no. I think a better explanation is that the water means John's baptism of repentance. It was a sign of a new convert to Judaism. It was a sign of repentance from idolatry and from sinful ways. Proselytes in Jesus' day were call called newly born children. And when we talked about John and his baptism, we said that all of Israel was going out, but the Pharisees refused. Why? Because they didn't want to be called newly born children. They were established. They knew the Torah. They knew how to do things. They knew how to work the system. They didn't need to be called a little baby. How insulting. What Jesus is saying here, I believe, is that there must be a baptism of repentance. There must be a turning away from the old ways, the old self, the old sinful desires, and turning toward God. John Calvin said the term born again, he means not an amendment of a part, but the renewal of the whole nature. Therefore, it follows there is nothing in us that is not defective. Again, Jesus is not talking about an upgrade. He's talking about an overhaul from the ground up. And so by being born again, we become children of God. Jesus has already talked about this in chapter one. But to all, would you read this with me? But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, 
he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your children have a special place in your heart. I remember bringing little Ariana home from the hospital and we put her right at the foot of our bed and, and I don't think we slept a wink that night, right? Did you hear that? Did she move? Did she sneeze? Did she cough? Is she still breathing? Is everything okay? We were just <gasps> like that, right? And that little kid had us wrapped around her little finger in a heartbeat. I mean, we loved her from the day she was conceived, but there's something about the doctor handing you or nurse handing you this child and saying, now take her home. And you go, what? Me? I got to take this child. I got to care for this child. I got to make sure they're, you know, and that, that just knits you with them. The, 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 the experience of being a, a, a child, of, of having that relationship, that's the one that God says is true of you. You're his. He'll never leave you, never forsake you. You are inscribed on his heart, his mind, his soul. He loves you in a way that human love of a child for a parent is modeled after, but doesn't even come close. Nicodemus is struggling. Jesus can see it on his face. Look at verse 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound and you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus, like any good teacher, is going to use an illustration. And he's going to say, listen, Nicodemus, it's like the wind. And here he's using a little word play. The word pneuma, which is wind, is the same word we use for the spirit. You can't control the wind. You can't, you perceive its presence by its effects. You can't explain its actions. All you can see is him moving and, 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 and making an impact and changing things. A relationship that we live out with someone is a dynamic and mysterious thing. It, revol it revolves around interaction. Sometimes it's unpredictable. Sometimes it requires cultivation. It's a living and dynamic relationship that goes and comes and grows. Dead things don't do that. Living things do. And then he goes on to say, for the mind, uh, sorry, uh, Paul uh, articulated this in Romans chapter 8 when he said, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. That's the dead part. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So there we have this body now that we're born with the first time, and we have a spirit now that is alive and growing because of new birth. Nicodemus continues to struggle. And Nicodemus said to him, verse 9, how can these things be? He's missing the fact that being born again is heavenly, not just earthly. It's not just what you can see. It's not just what you can experience here. And Jesus criticizes Nicodemus for not knowing this. Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand this? That seems pretty harsh. But what was Jesus referring to? Well, the idea of the water and the spirit is firmly established Old Testament theme. Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. For I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams on dry grounds. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. Nicodemus should have known that what God was planning in the great story was not just a bunch of rules to follow, but an indwelling spirit to change our hearts. Remember Acts chapter 2? 
Peter on the day of Pentecost says, says, this is happening in front of your very eyes. Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and it will come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. That's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes and fills and transforms a heart and life. Probably the most amazing verse of all is, sorry, I missed those, is Isaiah 36, where he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. From all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, a heart that's alive to the things of God, a heart that can move, that can respond, that can ask questions. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You see the difference now between the concept that, that, that Nicodemus said, oh, I gotta be good in order to get God to love me, to I want to please my heavenly father who's already cleansed me, who's already made me his child. I was orphaned, I was outside, I was a stranger, I was hostile to God, and he's loved me and brought me in and made me part of my family made me part of his family. Now, what else would I want to do but please him? These are the verses that are talking about the new covenant, the fulfillment of all that God had been working toward. Remember, Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Here it is, right among us, right in front of you, Nicodemus. Will you take it? It's a miracle, it's spiritual, it's a new birth, it's turning on the lights, it takes us out of darkness and into the kingdom of light. It changes us from the inside out in a way that we'll never be the same again. Truly, truly, amen, amen. That's what I want, don't you? I wanna be on that dangerous, exciting road of relationship with God through the Holy Spirit in such a way I'm not always quite sure what he's doing. You see, Nicodemus had figured out how to control God. No, God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. He only does this. Jesus says to him, truly, truly. Truly, truly. Amen, amen. I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen and you do not receive our testimony. Some people think that Nicodemus became a believer maybe after the resurrection, but at this point in time, it's very clear he's not made that step. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of God. Jesus is basically saying, listen, Nick, I've been there, I've done that. Remember how John 1 begins? He's the word. He's the creator. He's the start. He's the alpha. He's the one who put this whole thing into motion. And he says, if you won't believe me, well, who are you going to believe? You're not going to take what I've given to you? Then believe what you want to believe. I've told you simple things that you can't handle, let alone what else I could give you? You don't believe my testimony. You don't believe in me. And verse 14 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. There is no spiritual life. There is no eternal life apart from connection with Jesus and belief in Jesus. Oh, the world would like to have you believe there's many paths to God. Jesus is just one of them. Jesus did not come and say, hey, I am a way, I am a truth, I am a life. No, he said, it's me alone. John, the apostle, would later say in 1 John 5, this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. We'll talk about this next week as we go into John 3.16, arguably the most 
popular and, and uh, most memorized verse in all the world for very, very good reason. We'll see next week that the idea of salvation replaces the idea of condemnation from the law. So how do we apply this today? <clears throat> Let me end with a story. I've told this before, but it's worth repeating. Valerie and I were on vacation. Uh, we had a friend who had a timeshare in Brownsville, Texas. Yeah, you're thinking, wow, exciting, Brownsville, Texas. It's right on the coast. It's beautiful. We were swimming in a swimming pool, and this older gentleman comes up to me in a long Texas drawl, and we start talking. He's like, how you doing? I can't do a Texas drawl. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, I said, oh, fine. Where are you from? California. And he says, oh. So we, you know, small talk a little bit. And then he said, son, let me ask you this. If you were to die tonight, and God, you were to stand at the door of heaven, and God would say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? And I said, oh, yeah, that's evangelism explosion. Yeah, I've taken lots of, you know, we've hundreds of, you know, door-to-door -door evangelism in our neighborhood. And he looks at me and he said, yeah, well, what would you say? And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I know the answer. I've actually taught that course, and, and we do that a lot. He's like, son, I asked you a question. <laughs> what would you say? So I knew what he was looking for. I said, well, sir, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I, I count nothing of anything I've done to count for heaven. And I have repented of my sin. I daily repent of my sin. I connect with him on a daily basis because of what he's done for me on the cross. And he said, good enough. <laughs> and he said, you know, I led a pastor to Christ this morning in this very same swimming pool. <laughs> Good for you. And then he swam off to talk to somebody else. Truly, truly. truly. <laughs> Friends, it doesn't matter where you start. The path to eternal life is the same for all of us. You can be the most defiled. Or you could been, have been born in the back pew of this church. You could sit on the front row, you could sit on the back row, you could be sitting out in the middle of nowhere in the deepest pit right now online. It doesn't matter how you, how you get to eternal life is through Christ and Christ alone. We're not here to make the world a better place by micro improvements of your thought life. We're here for a radical change, a death to the old life, and new life in Christ. The greater the comfort we have in our old life, the less receptive we are to new life. We don't know what happened to Nicodemus. Spoiler alert for next week, sorry. We just don't know. This is too important for you not to know about. You can try to be a better person, far, follow more rules, work harder to get to God, love you, but you have to be born again through the water of repentance, the filling of the Holy Spirit in Christ. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, for some of you, that's a story you've heard many times, and it's a process you've been through maybe many times, but you know that. Let me ask you this. Isn't there a little bit of Nicodemus in all of us? Change was threatening. His religious sophistication, his ambition only made it harder for him to see because he had so much at risk. I remember when I first started hearing about house churches started hearing about disciple-making movements. I started hearing about this thing. Well, we don't need church buildings anymore. We're just going to meet, you know, in coffee shops and under trees and out to these places. Honestly, I was like, hmm, interesting. What will that do to me? I was threatened. Is my way of life over? Now, friends, that doesn't make it wrong, but it doesn't make it right. I had to examine that and say, 
Let's look at this and see what the scriptures say. Let's look at what the Holy Spirit is doing, even if it's a little bit threatening. Am I saying forget all that you've ever learned? Am I saying forget all that you've ever learned about Nicodemus from all those 19 other sermons that you've heard? No. I'm saying let's not let pride or arrogance keep us from continuing to learn. Amen? Let's, let's allow the Holy Spirit to blow fresh wind into some of those corners of our hearts and lives that when we get fearful, when we get afraid, when we, when we start putting up walls, we recognize that's happening and say, Holy Spirit, blow through this temple. Soften my heart. Break down my walls. Allow me to hear what you have to say through your word in whatever situation that you're in. And God will grow you in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do come before you with humility. Yeah, some of us have been around a very long time, Lord. And we're grateful for all that you've taught. Keep us as learners. Keep us soft. Keep us growing. Keep us learning in you. Lord, if there's someone here today that has never taken that step of faith to receive, to believe, to confess, then may this day be the day. A simple prayer, Jesus, I can't do it on my own. I turn from my ways toward you. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin, that you rose on the third day, and that you're coming again. In Jesus' name, amen.